Hello. It's good to be with you once again today, and I trust that you're having a, a good worship service, that you're being lifted up spiritually, and I'd like to present a lesson to you today about binding the hands of Jesus. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 51, we read of how the enemies of Jesus bound him in preparation for sending him to Pilate. The background of this text, as most of you know, if not all of you, is that when Jesus was put on his uh, so-called trials uh, as they uh, the day before his crucifixion and they shipped him to one person and then another and then another and then back to Pilate. Uh, Jesus was being mistreated. He was being abused. And this is an account in Mark chapter 15 verse 1 in this very verse where Jesus has his hands bound and he's led to Pilate. The text says immediately in the morning the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. As we read this, it's easy for our hearts to be filled with sadness and possibly righteous indignation against the crowd that did this to Jesus, our Savior, Lord, and Master. We don't like hearing such things. But that is exactly what Jesus went through on our behalf. And then, of course, he went to the terrible crucifixion on the cross. They bound his hands, most likely to where he couldn't fight back, to where he couldn't escape. And yet, when we think about it today, making a spiritual application, there are few today who are not guilty of binding the hands of Jesus in a figurative way. There are few today who are not guilty of binding the hands of Jesus today in a figurative way. During our time together, I would like for us to consider the various ways that we can be guilty today of binding the hands of Jesus. Think about these things. We bind the hands of Jesus to where it becomes impossible for him to do something by refusing to obey the gospel. In his great love for us, Jesus stretched out his hands on the cross and died for our sins. Even today, through his gospel, he pleads with all of us to take advantage of his vicarious sufferings on the cross on our behalf. He does not want us to suffer for the guilt of our own sins. He took our sins to the cross. At least all those, all those of the world, actually. But in, in reality, not everyone is going to take advantage of his suffering on the cross. But he doesn't want anyone to suffer for their sins. He wants all to come to repentance and eventually to salvation and eternal life through his death on the cross. In reality, in Matthew chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, that invitation is extended to us even today and to all mankind since Jesus uttered these words. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. There's the invitation of Jesus for all to come to him in obedient faith and take advantage of his suffering on the cross. In reality, when one refuses to obey the gospel, they are, in a figurative sense, binding the hands of Jesus to save that person. The hands of Jesus are bound. He can't do anything for that person if they refuse to obey his will. That person who refuses to obey the gospel cannot take advantage and receive the benefits of Jesus suffering on the cross for them. In other words, they can't receive forgiveness unless they come to Jesus. For that person, the death on the cross, Jesus' death on the cross, was in vain. It had no effect 
No meaning whatsoever. It's just another person suffering on a cross. Is that true for you? It is. If you have not yet accepted the gospel by obeying the commands of Jesus. In Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, here's the Great Commission. Listen to what Jesus said, telling his disciples, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every human. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Jesus might, might as well have said, He who does not believe, I can't help. My hands are bound. I can't do anything. And then Peter, in the day of Pentecost, in Acts 2 and verse 38, says these words to the crowd. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, when Peter said that, he and as much said, Come to Jesus and receive salvation. And let Jesus, his extended hands on the cross, take away your sins through obedience to the gospel. But for those who did not obey, who went on their way and refused to obey Jesus, refused, refused to follow the direction of Peter, and in doing so, refused to obey Jesus, Jesus couldn't do anything for them. So they bound the hands of Jesus when it came to their salvation. And this is true for you also, uh, that one day you will face judgment for what Je for refusing to do what Jesus uh, wanted you to do. You will suffer the righteous indignation and the wrath of God for not obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to what Jesus says in John uh, chapter 3 and verse 36. John chapter 3 and verse 36. Well, John says, it's not Jesus. John says, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. So for those who bind the hands of Jesus when it comes to salvation and the, and the suffering of Jesus on the cross for them, they are going to suffer the wrath of God for binding the hands of Jesus. But even those who obey the gospel today can be guilty of binding the hands of Jesus. How can they do that? By refusing to be transformed. We can bind the hands of Jesus by refusing to be transformed into his image. Christ, his will, is that we all be transformed into his image and become more like Christ. This transformation involves a renewal of the mind. Paul said in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This renewal comes when we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and are baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 23. And we're going to read through chapter 2 and verse 2. He says, that, well, let's start at verse 22. Since you, having purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, Love one another fervently with a pure heart. So he's talking to Christians here. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass, grass withers and its flowers fall away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, here's a transformation. Laying aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And that's just when we obey the gospel and we start our transformation process. 
in Hebrews, he's going to talk more about us growing on to maturity. And then in several other passages, he talks about us growing and, and transforming. Um, the Colossians talks about it also in chapter 3. So it's the will of Christ that we be transformed. But many Christians neglect the instrument by which we can be renewed again. What is that instrument? That instrument is the word of God. We do not, when we do not receive the, the word of God with meekness, which is able to save our souls, we are refusing that instrument which brings about our transformation process. Allowing, we sometimes allow other things to take precedent in our lives and, and get between us and, and steal away time for studying, steal away the time for digging deeper into God's word and putting it into practice. And when we do that, when we allow other things to get in the way from us studying God's word, we in effect bind the hands of Jesus so that we cannot change and we cannot go on to maturity and transformation in Christ. Could some of us be guilty of this? We are guilty of this if we neglect to study the Bible on our own. We are guilty of this if we fail to take advantage of the opportunities to study the Bible with others. Bible morning Bible class, Sunday morning Bible class, Wednesday night Bible class, some of the Bible classes we have on Tuesdays uh, with the ladies and, and other uh, night classes we have for the general uh, membership and others to attend. If we refuse to study God's word and, and go on to maturity in Christ, we are binding, binding the hands of Jesus. We, we are neglecting the word of God that he gave to us, God gave to us to help us go on to maturity in Christ and be more like Christ. So we bind the hands of Jesus when we neglect to study God's word. And if we neglect the transformation, transforming power of the word of God, we are just as guilty of binding the hands of Jesus as those were when they bound the hands of Jesus and led him away to Pilate. So we need to be careful not to bind the hands of Jesus. We can also be guilty of binding the hands of Jesus by refusing to pray, by refusing to pray. Jesus has become our high priest. He became man for this very purpose. He became man in the flesh for this very purpose, that he become our mediator, our one and only mediator. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, the Bible says, Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be merciful and that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. In things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Why wouldn't we want to pray to God through Jesus Christ, our mediator, for help during times of temptation? Jesus, our mediator, is tempted in all points, was tempted in all points like we were, or we are, and yet he was without sin. He knows what it's like for us to be tempted and to be drawn away. Not because he did, but because he was tempted like us, but he was not drawn away. Why wouldn't we go through, to God through our mediator to ask for help and let Jesus plead our cause before God for strength to overcome that? He has made it possible for us to boldly Approach God's throne of grace in prayer. In Hebrews chapter 4, 14 through 16, uh, the writer says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has been passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin, like I just said. Let us therefore, Come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. As our high priest, he is able to save those who come to God through him. 
In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He ever lives to make intercession for us. That's what Hebrews 7, 25 just said. That's why he came, so he could be our mediator before God, the perfect high priest. However, when we don't pray as we should, Jesus cannot be our high priest, our intercessor. Not because it's impossible for him, but it's impossible for him to intercede for us if we are neglecting to come to him in prayer. So we bind the hands of Jesus. Figuratively speaking, we have taken the praying hands of Jesus and bound them behind his back to where he can't help us. And we don't go to him in prayer. Are we doing this? If so, what a travesty this is. For he, for here is Jesus, here he is, who lives to intercede for us, but who can't intercede for us because we prevent him from doing so by our failure to go to him in prayer. We bind the hands of Jesus. Yes, there are many ways we can be just as guilty of binding the hands of Jesus today as those who uh, who were the righteous leaders in Jesus's day in delivering him to Pilate. But consider one more, if you will. We bind the hands of Jesus by refusing to share the gospel with the lost. Jesus has made his disciples to be his hands in taking the gospel to the lost. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, a parallel passage to Mark 16, 15, and 16. Listen to Jesus. Go, therefore, as you were going, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In 1 Peter chapter uh, 2 and verse 9, Peter says, But you... Christians are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Why? That you, mo that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Over and over again, the New Testament tells us to be ready to give an answer to those who ask for the reason of the hope that is in us. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, the things that you have heard from me, commit, uh, uh, share those with uh, faithful men of God, faithful people of God, who will be able to teach others also. And what are they to do? They are to take those words and commit them to other people that they may be able to teach others also. And what are they to do? The same thing over and over again. And that process is repeated. Why is that so? Because God wants us to tell others about Jesus. Jesus gave his great commission to his disciples, go and teach. But when we refuse to go and teach, we bind the hands of Jesus. Do you know that in every act of conversion in the book of Acts, Jesus used a disciple to tell the good news. In every single act of conversion in the book of Acts, Jesus used the disciple to tell others the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even the apostle Paul or Saul on the road to Damascus, what did the Lord tell him to do? Go to Damascus and there someone will be sent to you to tell you what you must do. And that was Ananias and he did. He followed the Lord's will, a disciple of Christ, and he went and he told Saul the gospel of Jesus Christ. And immediately upon hearing it, Saul was baptized into Christ. So there, there's no special way. It is the way, this is the way that God has designed it. 
for the disciples of Jesus to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But to the degree that we keep the good news to ourselves, we bind the hands of Jesus. To the degree that we hold back that message, it is to that degree that we have bound the hands of Jesus to where he can't do his salvation salvation works. We hinder Jesus from telling others of his wonderful grace when we hold back the message, when we have the opportunity and the wherewithal to do it. We bind the hands of Jesus in this way. Every day, countless souls die with no hope of eternal life. This need not be if more would make the sharing of the gospel, the primary concern in their lives. Now, I don't mean they go and, and tell everybody all day long that's the only thing that comes out of their mouth. What I am saying is that that should be on the foremost of our thoughts, looking for opportunities to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And when that opportunity comes, or we see an opportunity to create an opportunity, we need to take advantage of it. Because we may be the only connection to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ that some people may ever have in their lifetime. And if we hold back, and if we don't share the gospel when we have that opportunity, then we are, in effect, binding the hands of Jesus. Sadly, in too many cases, the primary concern of Christians is the pursuit of pleasure and the acquisition of worldly treasures. A pleasure is nothing inherently wrong with that. We like to, to uh, seek pleasure. Acquiring worldly uh, things in life, there's nothing inherently wrong with that unless we let that be our number one goal in life. And then that becomes our idol. And there is something inherently wrong with idolatry. But if sharing of the gospel is first and foremost in our thoughts, we are always going to be in tune to that, in tune to that idea that this one person, maybe I can reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ and sharing the good news with them, just one person. And then from that person, it branches out from there. Who knows, but that one person might be able to tell 15 or 20 other people and convert them to Christ. And then look how important that one decision you made to unbind the hands of Jesus and share the gospel with them. How important that decision was. Bringing glory to God is what we are in the business of. And we do that by sharing the news of Jesus Christ and the message that God wants us to deliver to the world. In doing so, we are sure to convey the gospel to the, uh, the gospel message to the lost and free the hands of Jesus to do his will. So in conclusion, yes, one does not have to literally bind the hands of Jesus to be guilty of the same sort of offenses that we read about in Mark 15 and verse 1. We don't, we don't literally have to take a rope and bind the hands of Jesus. We cannot do that. But figuratively speaking, we can bind the hands of Jesus by doing or not doing some things that God would have us to do or not to do. We can bind the hands of Jesus. So why not today resolve to loosen the hands of Jesus, unbind his hands, so that in us and through us, we can accomplish uh, his full desire. And his full desire is to save us. His full desire is to transform us into the image of his son. And his desire is to use us to accomplish his will in teaching others about Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is the will of God in us. Let us make sure that we're not binding the hands of Jesus today in any way and in our way, it would be figurative.
Let's make sure we're not doing that. So I want to offer the invitation now to those. Maybe you've, you're hearing the gospel for the first time. And you want to learn more about it. Then contact one of the brethren or one of the brothers or sisters in Christ and let your wishes be made known. And surely someone will study the gospel with you. If you're here today and you've heard the gospel preach and you're ready to put Christ on in baptism, uh, believing that he is the son of God, willing to repent, deny yourself to follow him and confess that Jesus Christ is the son of God and are willing to be baptized into Christ, fully immersed in water, buried with him into his death, burial and resurrection, raised up out of that water in newness of life as a child of God. We're ready for you today. We can baptize you in the baptistry that is behind you. We're ready to go. We can, uh, you can leave this building today or tonight and uh, out of this building, a child of God, ready to live faithful to him unto death. Revelation chapter two, and verse 10. If you're willing to do that, we're ready for you to obey the gospel. Don't put it off. You may not have another opportunity later. If you're here tonight and you, you have been baptized into Christ, but you haven't been living faithful to him, why not rededicate your life to the Lord and come home to Jesus and start following him again the way he would want you to. If you need the prayers of the church or we can help you in any way, we invite you to come as we offer the invitation at this time. Won't you come?